Good evening, afternoon, or morning. Wherever you are logging on from, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Shihoko Goto, Deputy Director for Geoeconomics with the Wilson Center's Asia program based in Washington, DC. And together with my colleague, Mike Sprega, Director of the Wilson Center's Polar Initiative, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to the second of our two-day forum on Asian interests and the path forward in the New Arctic. For those of you who are unable, who were unable to join us yesterday, we had two lively panel discussions offering perspectives from Japan, South Korea, and China, as well as the United States. The first focused on national interests and strategies in the Arctic, and the second on Arctic research and environmental change in the Arctic. We were also joined by US Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who offered her views on new opportunities for developing and furthering partnerships in the Arctic. Today, we're excited to have opening remarks from Japanese Justice Minister Yoko Kamikawa, followed by a panel discussion on economic development. And our final panel will focus on infrastructure development in the Arctic. It's an agenda that will allow us to dig deeper into the strategic interests of East Asian nations as well as the United States and the Arctic. And we are grateful for the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their support to make this program possible. I would also be remiss if I did not thank my colleagues, Jack Durkee and Michaela Stith, who are really responsible for making sure that we are coming together today, as well as colleagues from the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, as well as the China Environmental Forum. We will be taking questions from the audience throughout the course of this event. Please email questions to polar at wilsoncenter.org or tweet at Polar Institute. Again, that's email to polar at wilsoncenter.org or tweet at Polar Institute. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to the Honorable Mead Treadwell former Lieutenant Governor of the State of Alaska, former Chairman of the United States Arctic Research Commission and co-chair with Alice Rogoff of the Polar Institute Advisory Board. Meet the floor is yours. Uh, cold and chilly and foggy Anchorage, Alaska today. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Minister Yoko Kamakawa for her second appearance at the uh, Wilson Center Polar Institute. We had her in person a, a year or so ago, uh, last, uh, September uh, in Washington. And uh, uh, because of COVID, we were unable to do a, a re-exchange, but we're delighted to have you here today, Minister. Uh, Minister Kamakawa is not only Japan's current Minister of Justice, uh, but as a member of Japan's House of Representatives, or Diet, she is Chief Secretary of the Parliamentary Caucus on Arctic Frontiers Studies. She has been active in Arctic affairs, uh, working to encourage Japan's observership in the Arctic Council and uh, the development of Japan's Arctic policy, and as a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Arctic. In this current appointment in the cabinet of Prime Minister uh, Suga, made in September of 2020, Minister Kamakawa returned to the Ministry of Justice, where she had served as minister from 2014 uh, and 2015, and also 2017 and 2018 under former Prime Minister Abe. Uh, Kamakawa-san has also previously served as Minister of State for Gender Equality and Social Affairs in the cabinets of uh, Abe and Fukuda, and she is a member of the Liberal Democratic Party. I should also say, Minister, that uh, you did live for a time in Washington, D.C. and worked in the United States Senate. You attended uh, the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Uh, you were born in Shizuoka and Shizuoka uh, Prefecture, which is an area famous for Mount Fuji, partly in the prefecture, and also known as a growing area for matcha or green tea, which we find delicious at our house. And you are always a good uh, 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 ambassador for that, uh, that product. Uh, she worked for some time also at the Mitsubishi Research Institute. Uh, I now turn the floor over to Minister Yoko Kamakawa. Good 
Good morning, everyone in Tokyo. Thank you very much, Dr. Mike Straga and the team up at Wilson Center. Also, thank you very much, my longtime friend, Mr. B. Treadwell, for your kind introduction. It is my great pleasure to be able to attend this special webinar focused on the Arctic, and I would like to express my gratitude for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for organizing this wonderful online symposium, despite the global spread of the COVID-19. During my visit to Washington DC in September 2019, I participated in a cooperative dialogue between US and Japanese think tanks organized by the Wilson Center and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. I remembered very well, we had very fruitful discussion at that time. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to see some of you again through this webinar. Japan as a maritime nation surrounded by the sea on all sides is the closest Asian country to the Arctic, directly connected there through the sea. This geographical position makes Japan susceptible to climate change in the Arctic. Arctic surface air temperature has likely increased by more than double the global average over the last two decades, which was pointed out in the April 2017 report of snow, water, ice, and permafrost in the Arctic assessment performed by the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program and the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in the changing climate adopted in September 2019. The report made a shocking prediction that the Arctic may be largely ice-free in summer by the late 2030s. These ongoing environmental changes in the Arctic pose great threat to ecosystems and the livelihoods of the indigenous peoples in the Arctic and have become a truly global issue that could affect the whole planet. Japan will be investigating further through observation and research by actually promoting international cooperation while paying more attention to the effects on the indigenous people's lives. I have continuously been engaged in Arctic issues, even before appointment to the current position. I have participated in various activities of the Parliamentary League of Arctic Frontier Study as a founding member and the chief secretary. For example, in 2016, I visited Nee Olsen in Svalbard, Norway, to participate in an international workshop where I made a speech for the 25th opening anniversary of the Nee Olsen Research Observatory of the Japanese National Institute of Polar Research. In September 2019, during my stay in Washington, D.C., I had the opportunity to exchange views on Arctic affairs with the distinguished U.S. counterparts, including Ms. Lisa Makowski, Senator from Alaska. At the meeting, I proposed a new pillar of U.S.-Japan cooperation promoting cooperation with Arctic countries through inter-parliamentary channels. It consists of the following three specific proposals. 
First, to cooperate in hosting a side event in the third Arctic Science Ministerial, ASM3, to be held in Tokyo in May this year. Second, to cooperate in considering the use of Japan's new Arctic research vessel to be built as an international research platform. Third, to achieve bilateral use exchange programs for those tackling critical issues in the Arctic. I was very pleased that my dear Senator Makowski not only endorsed my concept, but also suggested her proposal to promote the US-Japan parliamentary exchange on the Arctic for further continuous discussions. In December of the same year, I also had a chance to exchange views with a group of young Athabascans, indigenous people of Alaska who were invited to Japan through the Kakehashi Project, a people-to-people -people exchange program between Japan and North America. Kakehashi indicates the bridge for tomorrow. In addition, in order to promote the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, in Japan's policy making, I established the LDP SDGs Diplomacy Caucus in April 2017. As chairperson, I led various activities and proposed policy recommendations. I believe that the achievement of the SDGs in the Arctic is a key concept for tackling a wide range of issues in the Arctic. In fact, looking at the trends of the Arctic Council in recent years, in which Japan has been an observer state, in 2013, Canada, a chair of the Council at that time, has raised sustainable circumpolar communities as one of the important agendas. Then comes Finland, chair of the Arctic Council from 2017 to 2019, has emphasized the implementation of the SDGs in Arctic cooperation. It is important for us to actively collaborate with various stakeholders with whom we share a common destiny on the earth, as well as to work together on challenging tasks from the perspective of a sustainable Arctic. And I think it's also important to ensure the rule of law as a common interest for both countries. The Arctic policy of Japan is based on Japan's Arctic policy, a national policy paper decided by the headquarters for ocean policy in 2015. And the third basic plan on ocean policy approved by the cabinet in 2018. Our policy basically consists of the following three pillars. First, research and development through strengthening the observation and the research system pertaining to the Arctic region. Second, international cooperation through proactively participation in the formulation of international rule. Third, sustainable use of the Arctic sea route. The Japanese government is working all together with private entities and research institutes for those goals. The Arctic region still has so many areas where our vacuum in observation data that we lack of scientific knowledge regarding the Arctic compared to other ocean areas. It is urgent 
to expand observations and research further. Since the establishment of the International Observatory in Olsen, Norway in 1991, Japan has been steadily and continuously conducting Arctic observations through international cooperation. These high quality continuous observation data have contributed to the prediction of global climate change. I am proud of this great contribution. In 2011, the Japanese government launched Green Arctic Climate Change Research Project as a large scale Arctic research project, contributing to the elucidation of the mechanism of Arctic warming amplification. As a successor five year project, ARCS, the Arctic Challenge for Sustainability, started in 2015. In this new project, young Japanese researchers were accepted by the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, where they were provided with variable opportunities for training. In 2020, last year, Ox2 was launched, in which we plan to further accelerate the collaboration between ocean and space observations in order to understand the dynamics of the Earth in cooperation with US. This will enable us to get a better three-dimensional view of the Arctic region and a better bird's eye view of the Earth. The data acquired by Japanese researchers will be made available to the world through the Arctic Data Archive System and will be utilized by many stakeholders in the world. In addition, social science researchers will also participate in the project and will accelerate giving back the research results to people living in the Arctic region, including the indigenous people, to understand how their lifestyle in the region will change due to climate change. It is also necessary acquire and to acquire and share the data on the Arctic Ocean through international cooperation among many countries. The Japanese government has decided to build an Arctic research vessel to serve as an international platform for Arctic research. The construction of the vessel will begin as soon as the Diet approves the government's budget draft. In the five years leading up to the vessel's commissioning, Japan will accelerate discussions on an international framework for strengthening the international observation network and a data sharing system for the Arctic region, including the strengthening of the sustaining Arctic observing networks to fill the largest observation data gap on the planet. The third Arctic Science Ministerial, ASM3, co-hosted by Iceland in Japan, will take place in May this year. This is an excellent opportunity to connect international ties in the field of science in the action Arctic region. Observational data from the Arctic region is, one, is of great significance in understanding and predicting the global climate change. In order to respond to this great challenge facing humanity, the Arctic region 
must be the embodiment of international cooperation, which may be called ocean of collaboration. With not only member states, but also many other participating countries, we would like to send out a powerful message under the theme of knowledge for a sustainable Arctic to build an international cooperative system for the future, which is necessary to make the Arctic region open to all humankind. For the success of the first meeting in Asia, Tokyo, I would like to ask for the support of US as the first hosting country of ASM1. Personally, I would also like to support the success of ASM3 and further deepening our bilateral relationship through the US-Japan parliamentary exchange event at the opportunity of the Arctic Circle Japan Forum. Due to the Arctic sea ice decline, there have been a growing interest in use of the Arctic sea route as a new option for marine, marine transport. For example, maritime transport routes linking East Asia and Europe through the Arctic Sea Route can shorten the voyage to about 60% with a lower risk of piracy compared to the Southern Sea Route via Morocco Strait and the Suez Canal. So I think it can be called Sea of Hope. Of course, we have to use the Arctic in a sustainable way because the Arctic itself is a fragile environment. With that in mind, Japan holds regular meetings of the Council of Industry, Academia, Government Collaboration on the Arctic Sea Route and promotes the development of an environment for Japanese companies to use the Arctic Sea Route by providing and sharing information on trends in related systems in coastal countries and in the use of the Arctic Sea Route. In addition, we are working to establish a navigational support system that will be useful in ensuring the safety of navigation in the Arctic Ocean, aiming for sustainable use. Through the Arctic Council and other international organizations, Japan will continue to cooperate and collaborate with other countries for contributing to scientific research and observation to sustainable economic activities that take into account ecosystems and the livelihoods of indigenous peoples and ensuring the rule of law. Especially with the United States, I hope that US-Japan think tanks will continue their collaboration to set up forums for discussion like this symposium and that political US-Japan cooperation and collaboration on the Arctic issues will further progress under the new Biden administration. And we welcome President Biden's announcement of the US rejoining to the Paris Agreement. Since the Wilson Center has a wide range of knowledge and ex experience, as a think tank, I have found it desirable to widen the scope of discussion to cover our common interests, such as tourism, fisheries, sea route, national security, public health, education, gender, telemedicine, energy, and infrastructure. At the same time, I believe it is also important to deepen discussion and exchanges at the political level. For example, by holding workshops with legislators, 
from both Japan and US. In order to demonstrate leadership by politicians, I myself would like to continue expanding US-Japan parliamentary exchanges, working closely with my friend, Senator Makowski. Thank you very much for your kind attention, especially to all the listeners. See you again in Tokyo. Goodbye. Uh, Minister Kamakawa, thank you very much for that exhaustive presentation and for your very long time work in building uh, Arctic relations for Japan and US-Japan relations. Uh, I know that you have to leave to go to a diet session. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Yamamoto is online, but since he introduced us and has had 40 years of helping to build uh, cooperation in the Arctic, I was hoping we could bring him up if he's there, but uh, uh, Zach uh, Fields, if you could just make a short announcement, that would be wonderful. Sure, uh, Zach Fields, I represent downtown Anchorage in the state legislature. And I did just wanna um, show everyone this special legislative citation that the state legislature is passing uh, to recognize Dr. Yamamoto's contributions for four decades and also Minister Kamakawa um, for her advocacy for security and economic collaboration between our two nations. So it's a real honor to be here um, as part of this panel and we will be mailing the original of the citation. Uh, thank you, Mead. Thank you, Zach. And we look forward to having you on the panel. Goodbye, thank uh, Minister. Thank you. thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our panel today is on economic development, and uh, on the Wilson website, you have exhaustive biographies of each of our panelists, but I think it would be uh, fair for me to say that uh, uh, I, I would just like to introduce the names of the panelists uh, very quickly. Uh, we will first hear from uh, Governor Tadeshi Maeda, who heads Japan's Bank for International Cooperation. Uh, he has been a longtime uh, advocate of joint work on uh, infrastructure and business development between Japan and the United States, but also uh, helping to build ties between Japan and the United States with other countries in East Asia. Uh, I had the chance to get to know him first as a member of the Northeast Asia Economic Forum, and I want to welcome him here today. Uh, Michael Perkinson is Chief of Staff and uh, uh, for Asia and, and also leads Asia Business Management for Guggenheim Partners. Uh, Guggenheim, Guggenheim Partners, uh, as you know, may, has been supporting the infrastructure inventory at the Wilson Center. And uh, Michael also supported uh, work uh, by Guggenheim on, on that inventory and the Arctic Investment Protocol in the previous work of the World Economic Forum uh, and at uh, uh, the Arctic Circle. Uh, I just want to say that Mike uh, not only uh, is chief of staff for a fund which manages several hundred billion dollars, uh, but he brings uh, to to do that he brings his uh, track record as a naval officer, a U.S. diplomat, and a strategic consultant. Uh, Dr. Aki Tanami is associate professor in international relations and economics at the University of Scuba, and she's also a senior research fellow at the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies, University of Copenhagen. And she did work before as a research advisor for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan and has had a special interest in the economic diplomacy and governance of the polar regions. Uh, Representative Fields, who you just met, is in his second term as uh, he's actually my state representative, uh, ran unopposed the last time. He's doing a, a, a very good job. Uh, and. Uh, he previously worked uh, at the Alaska Department of uh, Labor as the Workforce Development Coordinator for the Commissioner and was a congressional staffer in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, he also regularly writes an outdoors column for the Anchorage Press, which uh, shames it all because he manages to get his work done and also find some really, really good places to hike. Uh, Dr. Yamamoto, uh, our, our last panelist, is a board member of the Overseas Construction Association of Japan and former president of the Global Research uh, Fund, uh, Research Foundation Japan, and a former research director and Minister Kamakawa's colleague at Mitsubishi Research Institute. He also served on the board of the Institute of the North in Anchorage, Alaska, 
and has uh, a long time worked uh, between Alaska and Japan as uh, noted in the citation and uh, uh, we can go from there. So with that, I'd like to turn over the floor and welcome uh, Governor Maeda of the Japan Bank for International Cooperation and uh, uh, give you about 10 minutes to make your remarks. Thank you, Mead. Uh, some, some technical problems, my uh, uh, video has not been fixed yet. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to be invited to this in, uh, important panel on Arctic Ocean. Actually, uh, as I, my uh, dear friend, uh, uh, Minister Yoko Kamikawa uh, now said that Japan has been contributing for many years to support the sustainable development of the region of the Arctic. In particular, JBIC, by the way, uh, my mandate is to, uh, to uh, make sure that the long-term, the uh, very uh, stable, uh, the supply of natural resources from, from overseas to Japan is one of our, 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 our mandate. And the second mandate right now is that to, uh, to uh, uh, develop the, uh, the Japanese business overseas. And also in particular from that, that, that this juncture, uh, we are now the, uh, adopting a new uh, uh, long, uh, medium term business plan, which address more importance of the SDGs right now. Therefore, that we already have some of the to support the uh, 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 protecting against the climate change, and also that to develop that new uh, cutting edge technology uh, in this regard. And uh, we use the funds from the Japanese Treasury's uh, foreign, foreign reserve fund for supporting these these projects uh, quickly. Uh, and after the outbreak of the coronavirus last year, we have been supporting the Japanese business, uh, especially to make sure that the uh, this supply chain of business, uh, all of the business supply chain of these uh, companies. And uh, more specifically that, let me share that our experience in, uh, for example, that the in uh, our cooperation in the Arctic region we founded, we created uh, first uh, a fund for supporting the startup in the north, uh, uh, in, a, in a Norway and also in the uh, uh, Baltic states, which is a Nordic fund. Uh, we uh, pre and load of uh, uh, GP and uh, uh, we invited the uh, 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 limited partners from Japanese business including Honda, Amron, and Panasonic, and to invest in startup in the region. And uh, secondly, that uh, we have been working on at the Arctic Sea, Arctic sea Route <coughs> development, in particular uh, with a Russian partner, which is uh, uh, the Novatec, and the uh, Japanese companies, Jogmec, is a state-owned enter enterprise, and Mitsui, already committed to make investment into Arctic 2 LNG project. And uh, also we have been uh, discussing with Novacek and Russian uh, friends uh, on a facility of a transformation, uh, transshipment facility in Kamchatka and Mumbansk. And we are cooperating with them. And uh, with the United States, actually we received a personal letter from uh, uh, Senator Lisa Makoski in 2019 requested me to support the US-Japan uh, partnership in, for developing uh, uh, the liquefaction, uh, li uh, liquefied natural gas development in the state of Alaska. Uh, before that, the uh, JBIC already signed the MOU with the state of Alaska for, uh, 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 for supporting that the supply of uh, uh, not, just, not only just natural gas, but also that other minerals, which is critical to develop, uh, for example, that to develop uh, uh, the uh, new uh, products, uh, including uh, battery, which is a critical mineral that the Alaska state of Alaska can uh, have a uh, first, uh, uh, supply uh, kind of uh, supply chain to Asia. And I uh, also that in particular that the from the viewpoint of the distance, 
uh, to Asia market. The Strait of Alaska is very close, uh, closer than Russia, especially, especially Gidan Peninsula. So that uh, we expect the uh, more possibilities of uh, of uh, uh, supplying from Alaska of, nat of, of liquefied, liquefied natural gas to Asia market grace and to make the Asia LNG market more sustainable. <clears throat> That's uh, uh, my expectation. So that uh, uh, we are continuing uh, to uh, to support these business activities, <clears throat> even uh, in this uh, uh, even in the, uh, this uh, trend of ESG. Actually, the Prime Minister Suga uh, made his uh, first policy speech at Diet, and he committed to make a zero emission. <clears throat> Uh, by 2050, which is a very revolutionary uh, commitment. And uh, we are now uh, preparing uh, uh, for all of the policy measures to materialize this goal. And uh, I, but, in, but I think that the uh, LNG will play some role in the transition uh, to uh, be between now and 2050, in particular that using uh, hydrogen and uh, we are now expecting that new technology to make produce hydrogen uh, out of uh, uh, natural gas and using a CCS, yes, a carbon capture storage to, to fill back to that original uh, 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 well. So that's, uh, we, uh, Japan has a technology on CCS that we try to support this uh, in combined with a, uh, Friends from the United States. Thank you. Governor uh, Maida, thank you very much. I'm next going to call upon uh, Mike Perkinson. Thank you, Mead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, if, if I look at um, investment trends both in Asia and uh, in the Arctic, I, I must say that I am less optimistic than I was a few years ago. And I, I base that uh, perspective on um, a, a discussion I think you were part of, Mead, and that was, you know, when uh, President Obama uh, traveled uh, to Alaska, uh, and I participated, well, perhaps in a number of events, but a, a dinner uh, at which my senior colleague, uh, our chief investment officer, Scott Minard, uh, was at. And, uh, you know, there, there was sort of a, a general sense that so long as geopolitics did not intrude in the Arctic, uh, there was a tremendous opportunity uh, for investment um, and for, you know, investment in infrastructure and, and other things. And I think we can say that geopolitics has very much intruded uh, in the Arctic. And I believe that that presents an obstacle, not an insurmountable obstacle, but an obstacle nonetheless. Um, maybe I'll, I'll shift uh, slightly um, and talk about investment trends in Asia. Uh, as, as you mentioned, Mead, I have some responsibility for Guggenheim's business in Asia. And, and you know, for us, uh, you know, we sort of define Asia as, you know, from Tokyo to Tel Aviv. Uh, and, and I look at, um, uh, certainly China, Japan, and Korea, rapidly aging societies um, who need, um, you know, very strong uh, pension funds. Of course, Japan has, you know, the, the strongest uh, and largest or se second largest uh, pension funds in the world. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, and, and insurance companies as well. Uh, Korea has highly regulated insurance companies that are regulated very much like the United States. Uh, but, but that sector needs to grow to account for uh, a rapidly aging society. And, and China has neither, uh, neither a strong pension fund system nor a strong insurance sector. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they know precisely what they need to do. We have a number of clients in that area in order to get yield, and that is invest abroad. Um, if we look elsewhere in Asia, uh, beyond East Asia, um, you know, the, the geopolitical rivalry uh, between China and India, I think very much will inform how India invests. 
India, of course, has enormous limitations based upon its uh, relatively low national income level and you know enormous uh, population. Um, Central Asia, I think uh, a, a number of those states are going to start investing much like uh, uh, Middle Eastern countries did you know, 20 years ago. Uh, I think that they will become forces to be reckoned with. Uh, Azerbaijan in particular, now that they have uh, tidied up the, the problem that they have had for many decades in Nagorno-Karabakh, I think they will look towards Europe and elsewhere and look to invest uh, just like uh, Middle Eastern sovereign wealth funds and, and European institutions. In the Middle East, I think their investment view is probably informed by the demographic tidal wave that is sweeping through that part of the world. 70% of the population of Kuwait is under the age of 30. It's likely higher than that in a number of uh, other Gulf states that don't actually report demographic statistics. So that has taken institutional investors who used to really like high octane hedge fund style investments and returns and has turned them into uh, long-term investors. Uh, that's advantageous uh, to a firm like mine, certainly, um, but I think that will be a, a shift. So we will see investments, I think, in infrastructure, not so much the trophy real estate uh, that we've seen in the past, but, but in infrastructure. Um, investment trends uh, by Asia in the Arctic. Uh, there's certainly a, um, a need for infrastructure in the Arctic. I mean, that's, that's something that, that in, in, indeed me, I guess in full transparency, you, know, you and, and Scott have worked on together. Uh, I think the need is undiminished, uh, certainly, um, but I do think that we probably need to re-articulate the investment hypothesis uh, in the region in order to overcome geopolitical rivalry uh, you know, if it's a three-way scramble between the United States, Russia, and China in the Arctic, then investors, you know, won't want uh, that risk. Uh, so we need to assuage uh, uh, investors uh, or get them comfortable with that risk. In addition to that, I mean, the, the Arctic does have some challenges of its own. I mean, it has a very small population, very highly educated, but it struggles to retain that highly educated workforce in the Arctic. You know, there is that old expression, how can you keep them on the farm when they've seen gay parade? I think that certainly applies. Now, you know, there, the, the Arctic is, is, you know, you, you taught me need, is not monolithic. Um, you know, so some of these challenges are more acute in, in certain areas than they are in others. Uh, but, you know, we will need to overcome geopolitical rivalries and we will need to overcome you know, the fact that there's a brain drain uh, in the Arctic. Um, what's good about the Arctic? Uh, there's some truly fabulous and unique technology that has come out of the Arctic. We've seen some of it, we've invested in some of it. Um, and I, I think that you know, the combination of the highly educated workforce, especially in the Scandinavian part of the Arctic, uh, as well as some natural resources, educational institutions, means that we should look to that region for more uh, innovation, more technological innovation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not here to uh, support or, or advocate on behalf of the extractive industries, but in a period of time where there's a, a scramble to secure safe and reliable uh, access to rare earths, so we can all have these things, um, these, you know, mobile telephones, um, you know, the, the Arctic presents that opportunity as well. Some of it is not on land, some of it is beneath the sea. Um, data centers, uh, cold storage, distribution, ports, uh, all are uh, investment opportunities in the, um, in the Arctic. Um, how, how do we overcome the, the challenges that, that I, I, I believe uh, are manifest in the Arctic? Um, you know, there is that old, um, uh, comment by Winston Churchill that jaw jaw is better than war war. Uh, I, I think that dialogue is is the future here. Um, you know, I, I'm very supportive of um, the Arctic Council, the International Organization for the Arctic. Uh, 
It has a challenge that it is not undergirded by a treaty. It is therefore not a treaty obligation by any of the participants. So as a consequence, uh, unlike NATO, unlike the European Union, uh, unlike others, it does not, it has to operate on complete consensus. But at least it's a place that people can go to discuss the Arctic. And I think that's important. Um, when I was a very young man and I worked as a UN peacekeeper and got to know the United Nations, like a lot of Americans, I was prospectively skeptical uh, about the United Nations or reflexively skeptical about the United Nations. But I realized that uh, that was the place where the world's countries went to discuss their challenges and their differences. And if it didn't exist, we would have to create it. I guess that's the way I feel about the Arctic Council. I'm a big fan as well as uh, of the Arctic Economic Council. Uh, in full disclosure, Guggenheim is a member. Um, I think that there are other uh, ways to ensure that dialogue uh, continues. Uh, you know, certainly the Polar Center, one of them, the, the fine work that uh, Mike uh, Sraga and Jack Durkee and others have done on the Arctic infrastructure inventory, uh, I think will help prove uh, the investment case for the Arctic. Uh, I also think that the Arctic needs some ambassadors. It needs a higher profile by uh, Mead Treadwell, a higher profile by Anu Fredriksson, uh, who was formerly the executive director of the Arctic Economic Council and is now the head of the Arctic Frontiers, a higher profile by Mike Sfraga. Well, maybe not Mike, I'm just kidding. Um, and, and a higher profile by uh, truly um, incredible leaders like Senator Lisa Murkowski. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. I know that uh, uh, Mike Schrager has been trying to raise his profile uh, for a long time. It's, uh, he's uh, he's, he's going to get to six feet, I'm sure. Um, uh, Dr. Aki Tanami, uh, you're next. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to participate today. And, and I'm sorry we're not doing this in person, but such are the times. Um, I recall one of my first presentations to actually to do with uh, Japan in the Arctic was with the Wilson Center in 2014. So, uh, which seems like a long time now, but uh, I heard that uh, to study the Arctic, you need to have a hundred year perspective. So compared to that, this is next to nothing. Uh, my uh, today's, uh, my five key takes uh, takeaways are uh, first, Arctic international cooperation since the mid 2010s has not been necessarily smooth. Second, um, Japan acted um, within confines, came up with uh, its own Arctic policy and acted upon them. Third, um, stronger political will needed to encourage Russia to remove small but significant administrative blocks um, for scientific cooperation. Fourth, stronger leadership hoped for the United States with the President Biden. Five, a um, fifth potential for further cooperation on human rights in the Arctic, which is actually um, something I would like to build upon um, uh, what uh, Mr. Uh, Parkinson just mentioned regarding, um, uh, regarding continuing the dialogue. Um, so I know this is actually a panel to, to discuss economic uh, development, but I would like to begin by reiterating the importance and purpose of scientific cooperation, especially in the Arctic. Um, science has been one of the major platforms for collaboration in the Arctic, both during the Cold War and uh, since. It's the foundation of a peaceful Arctic, and we all know that without peace, sustainable economic development is indeed impossible to achieve. But uh, Arctic international relations have been turbulent since the Crimea uh, cri uh, crisis in uh, 2014. And uh, because of this, especially with regards to Japan, pretty much all scientific cooperation uh, or collaboration with Russia has stopped. So it's been also very difficult to work with the United States, uh, to be blunt, under uh, President Trump, as the Trump administration withdrew from the Paris Climate Agreement and weakened domestic measures to curb greenhouse gas emissions. The two, 2019 Arctic Council meet, ministerial meeting ended in disagreement, 
when the US apparently blocked the adaptation of a declaration because it contained language on the climate change. Naturally, it has proven very difficult also for Japan uh, and our scientific community to initiate any collaborative projects on the Arctic with the US under those conditions. With this political environment, as well as the fact that Japan is only observer of the Arctic Council, we, uh, Japan has crafted its own Arctic, official Arctic policy and acted upon them. As explained by the Ambassador Mitsuji and Dr. Tsunami yesterday and Minister Kamigawa this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, for those of you um, who were not present yesterday, or earlier when uh, Minister Kamika um, had explained, Japan adopted its first uh, official Arctic policies in 2015. It lists research and development, international cooperation and sustainable use of natural resources as specific uh, initiatives. For the fiscal year 2020, which will end at, this, uh, at, this, uh, at the end of this coming March, the Japanese government allocated 1.3 billion Japanese yen, which is roughly 1.13 uh, uh, million US dollars to matters related to the Arctic. And uh, interestingly, much of this uh, was spent on research and development, including the launch of the ARC2, the Arctic Challenge for Sustainability 2 project at 953 Japan uh, million Japanese yen, or 9.2 million US dollars. Um, roughly all Arctic researchers based in Japan participate in this project, including myself. To advance international cooperation, Japan signed the agreement to prevent unregulated high seas fisheries in the Central Arctic Ocean in 2018, which um, is of course, is set to be uh, former President uh, Obama's initiative um, it was also uh, re announced recently that the new Arctic research icebreaker will be built over the period of 2020 to 2026. As mentioned by Governor uh, Maeda on sustainable uh, use, Mitsui, which is one of Japan's uh, largest general trading companies, took 10% stake in Russia's Arctic, uh, sorry, Russia's Novatech Arctic LNG project. This move was supported by JOGMEC, which is a Japanese semi-governmental organization. And uh, the, uh, there's already a delivery of LNG from this Yamal uh, project uh, with, uh, with a Russian LNG vessel operated by the Mitsui OSK lines um, in the summer of 2020. So that was actually the first time an ice-breaking tanker arrived in Japan. This is also a talk of something called the Arctic Connect, uh, which is a submarine communication uh, cable project led by Finland to connect Europe and Asia. That cable is supposed to run along the Northern Sea Route and Hokkaido, which is Japan's most uh, Northern prefecture, would like, to, uh, make, uh, would like to position themselves as a part of this charge. Um, they claim that their cool climate is suitable for data centers and they already have broad experience of hosting that kind of uh, center. So, uh, with this in mind, uh, it's very, very positive that the United States would rejoin uh, the Paris Agreement and has already put forward a very ambitious agenda for addressing climate change at home and abroad. However, this doesn't mean that the US domestic audience, which can be highly skeptical about climate change, has suddenly disappeared. So viewing from Japan, we sincerely hope that the US will resume its leadership role in, in implementing the Paris uh, Agreement, and also to take an active role in strengthening the Arctic Council system to improve the overall governance of the Arctic Ocean. I'm confident that Japan's uh, already existing economic development project, as I mentioned earlier, with other countries um, in the Arctic, such as the LNG development, infrastructure, digital development, can be achieved with the United States, especially with the state of Alaska. 
Japan has also welcomed Mitsui's decisions to take 10% stake in Russia's Novatek Arctic LNG2 project. However, as I noted earlier, all scientific collaboration with Russia and, uh, between Russia and Japan is at, at a standstill. Apparently, um, apparently, I hear that the Russia would like to uh, increase the traffic via the Northern Sea route uh, by 90 million uh, tons by 2030. However, it's been extremely difficult for Japanese uh, scientists and ship operators to obtain basic data on navigation. This includes uh, marine observational data or data on accidents and contamination. I believe uh, this is the result of a combination of obstruction and ineptitude of Russian administrative bodies, which takes such a long time to process paperwork uh, submitted by Japanese scientists. So I really hope that there's going to be a stronger political will uh, from Russia, as well as some push from uh, other states such as the United States, China and South Korea to remove small but significant stumbling blocks to scientific cooperation. Lastly, another area that US and Japan can collaborate on is human rights. The Arctic uh, Council places importance on human rights, especially those of indigenous peoples and the US and Japan can claim uh, well, Japan claimed to be leaders in uh, respecting the rights of the indigenous peoples. There are already a number of uh, scientist driven projects within Japan's nationwide um, Arctic research program uh, to promote the culture of the Arctic indigenous peoples. But for uh, Japanese scientists, um, the importance of indigenous people is something uh, that we learn as we increase our, engage our engagement in the Arctic region. So it's not something that we knew from the beginning. So um, I hope to see this, this kind of learning from the Arctic will have a positive impact uh, on Japan's issues with its uh, own ind indigenous people, the Ainu, and their rights as well. And uh, I am confident that addressing human rights issue would uh, lead to the, um, the, the, the challenges that was mentioned earlier regarding um, the geopolitical rivalry and uh, brain drain, with, uh, especially with regards to the Arctic. If I may have the last few minutes and a final, more personal thought, um, some of you have probably heard about offensive remarks uh, recently made uh, by the Japanese head of the Tokyo Olympics, who is also a former prime minister, about the role of women in Japanese public life. With gender being such an important issue in Arctic research, we in Japan would do well to listen to and learn from that important discussion. That concludes my remarks. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. John, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I uh, uh, really appreciated your, your talk about uh, science access, among many other things, uh, having worked on that issue at the Arctic Research Commission. Uh, let me now uh, hand the microphone to Zach Fields. Uh, thank you very much, Mead. And I appreciate Dr. Tonami's reference to a hundred year perspective on the Arctic. Um, certainly in Alaska, we can look back a hundred years and think about how much has changed Alaska native businesses, uh, the very way in which we make decisions within uh, democratic institutions in the state of Alaska, which was not a state a hundred years ago. Um, but you know, our Alaska native organizations urge us to think in even longer term um, timeframes. Alaska natives have been here more than 10,000 years. And, our native organizations tell us we need to plan to be prosperous for the next 10,000 years. And I think it's it's a good challenge to all of us. Um, several years ago, I was on St. Lawrence Island and um, listening to elders who said the first time they noticed sea ice loss and an impact on subsistence populations was in 1957, which was decades before the New York Times was talking about climate change and sea ice loss. Uh, even more decades before James Hansen was testifying before Congress. You know, and then I think back, okay, so um, how much has it changed in the last 50 years? I think almost certainly the pace of environmental change will accelerate. Um, 
due to feedback cycles in the next 50 years. There's our 100 year window. Um, and again, <laughs> the people who have been here the longest tell us to look beyond that. And what's so remarkable, I think, for Alaska in looking back is, you know, 50 years ago, certainly the vast majority of the largest companies in our state were not Alaska Native organizations. They are now. Um, when you look at infrastructure development um, and public institutions, whether it's on the North Slope, um, whether it's in the Nana region with Red Dog Mine, nothing like they are today. And we've come so far, um, really, and a lot of those institutions have been pioneered by Alaska Natives. We're in a much stronger place to deal with rapid change today because of the, that institutional development. Um, I represent downtown Anchorage, and I, I just want to briefly reference my district without getting too parochial. Um, my district is very dependent on tourism. We have headquarters of um, oil exploration development, um, multinational corporations. We have fish processing facilities. And just down the road from my district, we have the fifth largest cargo airport on the planet, which at times during this pandemic has actually been the busiest cargo airport on earth. So really Anchorage is, I think, we're, we're a crossroads for the Arctic, but we're also a microcosm of a lot of cross currents in the Arctic, whether those are cultural, whether they're geopolitical, um, or whether they're related to the investment and business relationships. And I guess my view on it, certainly in terms of um, Japan and Alaska or Japan and the United States is we're very much in it together. Um, thank you um, to the long-standing investment that Japan has made in research and partnership with UAF. Um, we are dependent on that, we benefit from it. Um, and, I, and I think um, as Minister Kamakawa said, um, clearly Japan has seen the urgency of that. We've seen the benefit of direct investment from Japan, it's strengthened Alaska and it's, and it's strengthened Japan. Um, thinking about our LNG assets and our minerals, in my view, to the extent that we can strengthen those economic relationships, we not only strengthen our local economies, but we strengthen our uh, geopolitical posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia and ensuring that no one is excessively dependent on LNG um, distribution from that country. So um, I really appreciate being part of this panel of um, August panelists. You know, <laughs> um, It's a privilege and whatever modest role that I can play in the state legislature to support this relationship, um, I, I wanna stay a part of that. Thanks again, Mead, for the invitation to be here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zach, and uh, also thank you for the work that you're doing with the Japanese government now to try to expand the number of uh, air routes. Uh, uh, I'm sure Governor Maeda can remember that uh, early in his career, if you were flying between Tokyo and London or Tokyo and Washington, you stopped and saw the big bears at the Anchorage airport. We're trying to get more direct, uh, get direct flights back, and uh, we think access in the Arctic is, is tremendous. And uh, uh, Representative Fields, you have been leading that effort uh, with uh, Senator Tom Begich in, in the legislature, and thank you for doing that. Um, we have had a, a, a bit of a technical uh, challenge. Dr. Norio Yamamoto is our next speaker. Um, and uh, Mike, is he online now? Do you know? He's not yet online, but trying to dial in. Okay. So perhaps... Um, Let's go to questions, and then uh, when Dr. What, Yamamoto yeah. makes on, we'll... Why, why don't we go to questions? And just a kind of a prefacing questions, we, we heard a lot today, and you know, I, I, I wanted to just say that, uh, uh, Governor Maida, you talked about uh, 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 the work that you've been doing with uh, LNG natural resources between uh, Japan and Russia, Japan and Alaska. Uh, personally, because I'm involved in the LNG, I'd like to thank you for your supportive uh, uh, work on Alaska LNG. Uh, and I guess the, the first question I'd like to ask of, uh, of you and the other panelists is, uh, during the last administration, I'd say cooperation was focused on a Japan-US energy initiative and also an interest uh, in working together with uh, Australia, India, uh, uh, other countries uh, on what was an Indo-Pacific initiative. Uh, and now we're seeing an emphasis on climate where among other things, uh, President Biden had a recent executive order trying to de-emphasize uh, fossil fuel financing through our international banks. And so I guess the question for you is what, what do you believe these, this change means for energy cooperation between 
uh, Japan and Arctic countries, especially Japan and the United States. Thank you for the question, uh, Meet. Actually, we are very carefully watching the development of the Biden team, Biden administration, the new policy. And uh, I am a little bit concerned about uh, the uh, very swift shift from policy agenda from Trump administration to the Biden administration. First, that the free and open the Pacific, which is being originally uh, initiated by former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2007, uh, by the statement in the in uh, uh, parliament in, in India, uh, named the Conference of the Two Seas in the Pacific. However, that the, I heard that Biden transition team uh, hesitating to use this free and open the Pacific initiative because the Trump administration used uh, quite a bit. But uh, in January, in January, uh, mid January, that the uh, policy paper named the U.S. Strategic Framework for the Indo-Pacific had been, was declassified uh, by the uh, former National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien. And he articulated that this initiative was started from Japan and, uh, uh, and echoed by by United States. Then that's the new five, uh, first telephone call between the Prime Minister Suga and uh, President Biden most recently, they uh, both two leaders agreed to uh, to promote this initiative, Indo-Pacific, free and open Indo-Pacific, and and the terms has been fixed already to uh, use these terms. But having said that, uh, you know, I think that there's some sh change on the focus from the Biden administration will be made. First, that the, uh, the the Biden administration is more focused on the climate change, and and also that the uh, ESG investment. So we are now preparing for that the shift, obviously, and we, we uh, Japan has a lot of uh, technology base for that the, those new trends of investment, and also we have the already established framework of the trilateral partnership among the U.S. Japan and Australia. We have been uh, conducting a number of the uh, online conference with a, a Department of Foreign Affairs Trade of, of Australia and uh, USDFC. And we uh, sent a joint mission to, to the many uh, countries, in particular in the, in the Pacific region. So geographically, it is still not so clear that the Arctic will be a part of that, but I believe that uh, you know, because of the strategic sense that the Arctic can be can be a part of the cooperation of of this free and open the Pacific Initiative, and uh, I also heard that the President Biden has a telephone call from, from uh, with a uh, uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, yesterday, probably. And uh, also, I had made I made a uh, video conference with Narendra Modi last year on one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, video meeting with him for almost one hour. So that he's also uh, the uh, very strongly the uh, supporting that the uh, idea of free and open the Pacific and India can play the certain law. So we have in national security uh, fields that we have a quad already. And this quad can be applied to that economic partnership on the free and open in the Pacific. However, that the India is not part of negotiation of OSEP. And there are some uh, conflict between, in particular between India and China, economically, not just only a military security region. Therefore that we may have to be very carefully inviting on this, um, making this um, breathing block on a uh, more tangible the uh, case as, as a uh, as a uh, uh, cornerstone of a cooperation that India might be a for force partners on a, a trilateral partnership to be added. 
Uh, would any other uh, 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 panelists like to uh, comment on this question? Okay. Um, well, uh, Governor Maida, th uh, thank you and good luck on uh, uh, on those discussions. I know that uh, I, I've had several discussions with U.S. Japan experts in in preparation for this panel and the question of growth of fossil fuels in replacing coal, uh, you know, growth of gas and in, in replacing coal versus a, a policy that uh, kind of wants to uh, steer away from uh, from fossil fuels will lead for some very, very interesting discussions. Uh, but uh, the technology that you mentioned, that Michael mentioned, uh, all makes a difference. I think a second question I'd, I'd like to ask all the panelists is to comment really on the role of Russia. Uh, we opened the border between the United States and Russia in the late 1980s. Uh, we looked hard at uh, cooperation in the Arctic and the jaw jaw that uh, Michael mentioned is there uh, uh, and uh, continues at the Arctic Council. Uh, Japan seems to have a better avenue for economic cooperation with Russia than, than the rest of us given sanctions. And Michael, I'm just wondering if you, Governor Maida, uh, Dr. Tanami, uh, uh, Zach, uh, have any view of how this might change in the next few years? How the role of Russia might change me? Uh, how how the, the kind of the, the barrier against investment uh, might change. Mm. Uh, Japan seems to have broken through more than the U.S. has. The U.S. has held back investment. And do you do you see this changing at all? Do you see? I I, I guess I don't um, anytime soon. I mean, you know, we at at, at Guggenheim, um, regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission here in the United States, um, uh, you know, have have frequently been in a position where we've had to say we look forward. Uh, to a time when uh, we would be permitted to make investments in Russia, uh, but unless and until um, you know the, the sanctions um, circumstances change, that's unlikely. Uh, I don't see U.S. or EU sanctions ending soon, um, especially during this period of time where the Putin government is particularly and acutely vulnerable. Um, I think history will tell us that there's no incentive uh, to lessen the sanctions. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, geopolitical realities are such that, you know, Russia has the largest, you know, frontier there in the Arctic and, you know, the Northern Sea Route is, is certainly the, the more passable of the, the two uh, routes. And so it's got a lot to, to offer, no doubt, but uh, I'm afraid I don't see that changing anytime soon. Governor. Well, we have been working uh, for many years with Russian and uh, uh, the sanction is a very important element. And we have been very carefully uh, watching and uh, contacting with the of Office of Foreign Asset Control of the United States how they, uh, and also that we notice every time, each time that the new, any commitment to Russia that we notice that commitment to the Office of Foreign Asset Control, OFAC, and uh, listen to them very carefully. Uh, but the key issue is that the difference between that the pipeline gas and LNG, because the pipeline gas uh, is a, is, uh, has only a, the destination, one destination, especially, uh, pipeline from the Russia to Europe. Uh, it is uh, quite the, uh, understandable that the US puts a sanction on Nord Stream, uh, the pipeline gas. But LNG uh, uh, is a more free, you know, flexible. And I know, you know, we can, our goal is to exclude, uh, uh, eliminate all of the destination costs and a uh, free LNG market. So if the Russian supply of LNG from the uh, from the uh, uh, Yamal and the Arctic to to Asia marketplace, and the uh, we can more make a more flexible market, LNG market, in particular that now at the uh, uh, spot spot prices of LNG has been increased uh, 
uh, due to variety of reasons. Now there's more, more than 30 dollar per billion BTU right now. And also we have the problem, long-term problem of Asian premium uh, on, a, on the uh, terms of the uh, conditions uh, of LNG, the import. Therefore that now, in, you know, Russian export of natural gas has been for many years been monopolized by Gazprom. But Novatec is a private company. We are now carefully watching that Novatec can be uh, targeted, the sanction by US or US. But I, my sense is that it would be not the uh, targeting because, it, uh, 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 because it's a private company, unlike the Gazprom. So, uh, uh, and also that the uh, Novatec is very listened to us very carefully uh, and they use, and also that for United States that you, that US that don't have any capabilities of uh, uh, manufacturing energy vessel with ice, icebreaker capability. Russia already owned the 17 vessel, mainly uh, the constructed by Korean uh, shipbuilding company. And I think that we, uh, we uh, uh, instead of the putting sanction, we a very easy, easy piece that is sanction on any LNG uh, by Novatec, but I would recommend the US to make the, their own capability, that the uh, shipbuilding capability uh, with ice breaking, uh, ice breaking capability. Therefore, that's in that sense, I think that piece of registration, which is a Jones Act, can be a, can be a, a stumbling block to develop. And it is a very protectionist protection style of the of all piece of registration. But uh, I do hope that we, uh, we move, the US, the Congress in particular, will remove this old fashioned uh, constraint by Jones Act. Well, those are, uh, those are important words. Uh, uh, Dr. Tanami. Yes, um, I would like to actually uh, chip in about the uh, sci scientific cooperation with Russia. So it has proven um, almost impossible to discuss any kind of uh, defense or military issues with Russia. Um, and then I, I realize that it's also the case with uh, within Arctic states. Uh, but one of the things that we were saying as a kind of a, to in order to continue uh, or maintain channels of communication or dialogue is uh, uh, the discussion on social science. Um, so it, it, social science is one of the areas where Russians are still uh, Russian scientists are still able to and willing to have uh, dialogues with um, Western states and um, particularly on issues such as gender and brain drain. Um, which is caused by the social economic sort of characteristics of the far north or far east uh, region, which is also shared within the circumpolar uh, Arctic region. So um, it's not directly linked to economic development or the investment per se, but it, it can be the basis of uh, continuing or maintaining channel, channels of our dialogue. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, you had mentioned science access before, and it, uh, yesterday the science agreement in the Arctic Council was discussed by several speakers. And uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, as somebody who pushed for that agreement, uh, the fact that the Russian Foreign Ministry asked for it to be a formal agreement to help keep uh, the reciprocity open was important. And uh, I think we have to keep testing that agreement and, and at the same time uh, at, at the same time, encourage the kind of cooperation that you've uh, spoken of. Uh, Representative Fields, uh, is there any comment you'd like to make on this general question of working in the North Pacific? I guess the only observation I would add is that the activities of other countries can add a sense of urgency to make investments in infrastructure that, frankly, we should be making anyway. And I guess I would just cite the, the deep draft port in Nome. Um, which Congress has recently approved. And of course, the second icebreaker, those are things we should be doing anyway, given changes in shipping. But if other countries' activities in the Arctic um, help provide a sense of urgency, I, I guess those investments can be seen as a silver lining. Well, thank you. And, and then Governor, Governor Maida, you talked about the, the Jones Act and American shipbuilding. I know we've, you and I have talked recently about Japanese shipbuilding. 
I guess all I can say is that uh, if Russia's aspirations with 17 tankers, uh, if you look at Russia's LNG aspirations, they will probably have maybe as many 40 uh, LNG tankers. If you look at our aspirations with LNG, uh, if we're direct shipping, uh, it's possibly 25 LNG tankers. And I look at Eastern Canada or Western Canada now, also studying direct shipping through the Arctic. That's another five to 10 tankers. So even, even in your own country, there's a shipbuilding opportunity. And I, I, and I know that Japanese ship operators, uh, MOL, uh, 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 one of them are, are actively involved right now and there, there may be others. So that's, that's very exciting. Um, I'd like to end the panel uh, because we had a technical difficulty with Dr. Yamamoto. I understand that he is, uh, is there. He sent me a couple of slides and I just wanted to put them up for you from his, his view, if I can do that. Um, if, if let me, uh, uh, let me share here. Uh, he, he wanted to speak to, to three, three visions. Uh, he came to Alaska in the early 1980s, uh, working with the head of the Global Infrastructure Fund Research Foundation, former head of Mitsubishi Bank and Mitsubishi Research Institute. And uh, his, his vision was the Arctic would play a major role in global infrastructure, including telecom, polar aviation, polar shipping, supply of protein, supply of energy and minerals, and as a focus of tourism with a circumpolar vision at the top of the world. In fact, all of these things were discussed at a conference that he organized here at Alaska Pacific University in 1986. Uh, the, uh, the second part of the vision is that he also felt that Alaska, Russia, and Japan could help each other cooperate, and that ultimately joint investment in energy, shipping, and telecom science would otherwise help the world. And he said he's seen that vision, realized as the Northern Forum, which was actually a Hokkaido initiative to begin with, uh, with the governors, uh, but also the Arctic Council. And uh, you had Alaska companies, Japanese companies, Russian companies working together at Sakhalin uh, Island on LNG. And Russia's development of Yamal LNG has, as Zach just mentioned, uh, stimulated thinking on this uh, direct shipment from the Arctic uh, for both the Alaska Kelak LNG project and the Northwest Territories of Canada project. And uh, uh, he, he cited Japan's role as a major investor and consumer in Arctic fisheries and a linchpin in polar aviation. So uh, the Arctic is an indispensable place in the global community. Uh, he believes that at the beginning of President Biden and Minister Suga, uh, Prime Minister Suga's time in leadership, an Arctic agenda for economic development can do many good things for the world. And he points first as, uh, as Minister Kamakawa did to Arctic shipping. Said, Arctic shipping will help the economies of Asia, but cannot happen without the cooperation of Arctic peoples, protection of food security, which relies on fish and mammals from the Arctic Ocean. And we should work together to make shipping safe, secure, and reliable. And uh, toward, toward that end, I will say that we've developed at the Wilson Center with help from Minister Kamakawa, Governor Maida, and others, a, 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 a new study group that Congress just approved to look at stronger cooperation on Arctic shipping uh, here, which will be getting started under the new Secretary of Transportation. Uh, Dr. Yamamoto also uh, urged us to think about Arctic energy in Japan and other Asian countries. Uh, he points out that natural gas from the North that helps reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Asia and more conversion by coal uh, uh, from coal by North American LNG is a goal the US and Japan have agreed to even to help third nations. Uh, he said he looks forward to the contribution of American Arctic LNG. On the energy challenge for the future, he says US and Japan are partners with Russia and other countries in the quest for fusion energy through the ITER program. Wanted us to be remembered that and uh, uh, strongest Russian advocate for the uh, ITER program uh, the fusion research program came to Alaska, Dr. Yamamoto's introduction a few years ago. And of course, there has been a lot of Japanese US cooperation on the idea of small scale, safe nuclear power and uh, the idea that it may be able to help uh, remote communities with small microgrids in Alaska. Uh, and for SDGs, he wanted to say he's impressed with continuing new science and carbon capture and sequestration and believes the Arctic can be an expanded test bed 
for our common national objectives. He referred to Japan US DOE cooperation on gas hydrates incurring in Alaska. JOGMEC has made a $10 million investment this year in Northern Alaska on gas hydrates. And uh, we're hearing that uh, hydrogen and ammonia technologies as we already heard in this panel uh, can, can also help uh, uh, realize the economic value of the large feedstocks of natural gas in the North. And uh, Zach, this is for you uh, uh, on air routes. Uh, he said, we often visited Anchorage and uh, he said he supports what you're doing in terms of getting more direct air routes uh, between Japan, East Asia and, and uh, Northern North America. And on climate change, that support. Uh, on, on climate change, he uh, says, conclude, uh, let me uh, remember the conference we had in Alaska and you had all these experts on building infrastructure. And in the end, what they really talked about was sustainability. And uh, early the next year, uh, Gro Harlow Brentland, the prime minister of Norway had completed the sustainable development report for the uh, UN and uh, sustainable development became a catchword. And I wanna thank him for his uh, leadership on that. Uh, his point uh, as a summary is that the climate is changing, but we still need energy, food, commerce, and an economic development policy for the Arctic will not rule out new projects in the Arctic, but will work to make them better. So uh, Michael, there he is countering your pessimism, uh, but uh, uh, you know, there's no better time to, uh, than coming out of this pandemic to look at this. So he remains at the end of his career, he says, a continuous and strong proponent of science and tech cooperation. Economic opportunities uh, will rest on cleaner energy, better biology, more efficient icebreakers, energy storage, nuclear and fusion and advancement, quantum computing and telecommunications. And as Arctic thinkers, he says, we are future thinkers. And as future thinkers, let us remember that we'll do old things better and new things we barely dreamed of when we support science. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, and uh, thank Dr. Yamamoto for sending his slides. And uh, uh, it's very nice to see all of you and we're going to take a 10 minute break. I'm gonna hand this back to, to uh, Mike Schrager. Thank you, Mead, and thank you everyone on, on the panel. Uh, wonderful insights and perspectives. And we apologize for the technical difficulties, but we work through them. Amit, thank you for covering those, those last comments with those slides. Uh, a note from, from both days is that we will have all of the PowerPoint presentations available on our website uh, after we conclude this session. The entire two days have been recorded. They also will be available on our website. Uh, I, we had planned for the next panel to begin at 7.45. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Lawson if we would still like to begin that at 7.45, giving everybody 15 minutes DC time, giving everybody 15, a 15 minute break. I don't think that that's a bad thing to do. Well, welcome back everyone. Uh, thank you for a, what I thought, uh, wonderfully insightful first panel on economic development in the Arctic. It's time for our final panel of two days, a two day symposium. Uh, but a critically important panel on infrastructure in the Arctic. This panel is moderated by our colleague, Dr. Lawson Brigham, who serves as a fellow at the Polar Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center. As many of you know, he also served as the Coast Guard icebreaker captain, uh, commanding four cutters, including the Polar Sea on Arctic and Antarctic expeditions. And he also serves as a fellow at the United States Coast Guard Academy's Center for Arctic Study and policy. Lawson, thank you so much for moderating this panel and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. And, and thanks to the uh, Foreign Ministry of Japan for supporting uh, this, uh, this conference and this engagement with our uh, Asian colleagues. Uh, today we have, we're gonna speak about Arctic infrastructure. Infrastructure is kind of a loaded and complex term, means a lot of different things to, to a lot of a lot of people around the world, mainly roads and communication. Uh, but I think we'll focus a little bit, I think on marine infrastructure, as we know more than 60% of this place at the top of the world is ocean. And, and, and what we lack, we, we actually have treaties, five treaties counting the polar bear treaty and the treaty in the central Arctic ocean, but treaties on SAR, 
search and rescue, oil spill preparedness and response, and science or research. And while we have these great treaties, particularly recently in the last decade and a half, the missing link to execute these treaties is in fact infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure that we deal with mostly in the Arctic Council is related to marine safety and environmental protection, which of course directly relates to the environment and of course, importantly to people and coastal communities in the Arctic Ocean. And the other element of infrastructure I think we wanna focus on today is research infrastructure. The needed research infrastructure to monitor and understand this profound, the profound changes that are happening at the top of the world, more rapid as we know these changes than, than anywhere else on the planet. Have uh, five uh, distinguished panelists. I, I'm lucky guy because I know all of these, these people pretty well in various engagements around the world. So it makes me happy to uh, present them. We have two engineers, a geologist, a political economist, and a lawyer in, in my interpretation of their bios. Now, first we have Justin Kim, who is a vice, pres vice president of research at the Korea Maritime Institute. Uh, Justin has led the Arctic Policy Research Program at, at the Institute and uh, has also uh, led uh, this North Pacific Arctic uh, Conference that, that four of us in, on this panel are involved with. And he, importantly, uh, Justin has led uh, Korea's work with the Arctic Council. And, and Justin is, in, in my uh, interpretation of in, in English, is a marine architect and naval engineer by training. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Natsuko uh, Atsuka, who's a professor at the Arctic Research Center at Hokkaido University. Um, Natsu has spent uh, several decades as R&D manager uh, for the North Japan Port Consultants. So he has extensive experience, trained as a civil engineer, has experience in ports and port engineering, and has done a lot of research on, in fact, the Northern Sea Route and its potential. Lori Perot is the manager of Arctic Science and Security Initiatives at one of our national laboratories in New Mexico, Sandia, uh, laboratories. Uh, Lori's uh, group manages uh, all of the research facilities on Alaska's North Slope. Uh, Lori's a geologist by training, but has uh, managed and is currently managing uh, atmospheric and environmental research programs at the, at the laboratory. Our uh, fourth speaker is Yang Jian, and he's a vice president, senior fellow at the Shanghai Institute for International Studies. He's also a director of an institute that deals with international organizations and governance at Shanghai University. He's been involved in research on China's uh, Arctic policies and polar policies, cyber governance. And he, he's our, uh, I think, uh, political economist. And finally, uh, Sherry Goodman is uh, an old hand in Washington, an experienced hand in Washington, DC. Sherry is currently a senior fellow at the Wilson Center in two programs, Environmental Change and Security Program and in our Polar Institute. Uh, Sherry has long experience in Washington as a, uh, uh, a, a uh, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Environmental Security. Uh, she was a senior VP um, and general counsel for the Center for Naval Analysis and also president and CEO of the Consortium of Ocean Leadership and being chief counsel, of course, she's our lawyer on this panel. So uh, welcome everyone, thank you for participating. And uh, we'll begin uh, with a view from Korea. I, I should say that all of these presentations are of a personal nature using each individual's experience and don't represent the official views of the various countries and institutions. So Justin, um, could you give us your view of infrastructure, please? Thank you, I Russell. think you have Do some you slides, me? right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, good day to all. I'm, I'm Justin Kim, just introduced by the law zone. I'm working at Korea Maritime Institute, which is a government affiliated research institute under the National Research Council for Economics, Humanities, and Social Science. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to congratulate this successful seminar hosted by the Western Center and Japanese government. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to join us, join you. Uh, as we are all aware, in the last decade, change in the Arctic has been drastic. Among them, I think that the change of the international community's perspective on the Arctic and the expansion of the participation of the new partners in Asia were very important changes. In this sense, I think yesterday's and today's seminars were a great opportunity to ex examine and discuss the direction of the cooperation in the next 10 years. In particular, I think this session is more meaningful as it deals with infrastructure, a key issues of sustainable development and cooperation in the Arctic. Uh, can you see my slide? Okay, thank you. Uh, today, I'd like to present a comprehensive concept of the infrastructure needed for sustainable Arctic and uh, briefly explain what cooperation program has been pursuing in preparing for the past and the coming decade in, the, in Korea. And finally, I'd like to present my personal opinion for strengthening and the uh, infrastructure cooperation in the future. Uh, impact, uh, I think the participation in infrastructure development in any region requires trust between countries or companies where we keep the cooperation system and institutional support. I think the Arctic region is no exception, rather I think that the Arctic, which has a, a unique natural environment, economic structures, needs more detailed preparations. As we know well, uh, there are some very important challenges for the Arctic. The fragile natural environment, the weak consumption market, the limitation of the condition necessary for business, the social economic cost to be added compared to the other region, and the dispute amongst the powerful countries are main factors to be considered in the development of Arctic infrastructure. In addition, access to the Arctic is gradually improving and the Arctic economy is gradually included in the global economy and social, uh, scientific and uh, technological advances are increasing possibilities of sustainable development in the Arctic and efforts for human exchange and mutual development within partners are also being strengthened. In this respect, I, I believe that the definition of infrastructure in the Arctic requires a sustainable and comprehensive approach because of the challenges of the opportunities facing in the Arctic. In this regard, I think IDB's definitions on the infrastructure is very proper in the Arctic. Uh, so uh, now I will briefly explain what efforts Korea has made for uh, the four components of the, in the Arctic uh, in, in the past 10 years and what kind of efforts it will be made. Beginning in the early 2000, the establishment of the Korea's Arctic science infrastructure has been expanded through the establishment, establishing of science base, building research network, and expanding our participation in international researches by polar research institute and universities. In addition, in order to strengthen uh, research in the Arctic Ocean, especially in the Central Arctic Ocean, we are pursuing the construction of the new generation ice-breaking research vessel, and we are considering it in, in types of the LNG hybrid to suit the Arctic environment and conditions. We hope to expand this scope of the ex existing ice breaking research vessel around and become 
on important infrastructure that can be used for international, international researches. Research using satellite has also begun in parallel with research activities on icebreakers. A CAMSAT satellite, which has a high resolution, a high level of resolution is expected to become the basis for monitoring and observing changes in the marine life over a wide range as well as sea surface changes. Considering the present natural environment of the Arctic, I think that the introduction of the advanced technologies to minimize adverse impacts must be considered. And we are furthering, we are further developing technologies that minimize the risk factors of the uh, ship itself uh, with cutting edge technologies. In addition, considering the limited manpower and extreme natural environment of the Arctic region, the fourth industrial revolution technology will be a new alternatives for safe and continuous activities in the Arctic. Our port facilities in need to accept economically sized shift to connect Arctic resources or products to the world market. Airport facilities to provide business environment in areas that are not accessible by sea or land. The logistic transport lines and people reside. Roads and railroad uh, that can connect areas and support continuous economic activities throughout the four seasons necessary infrastructure for long-term development. Korea is gradually expanding its incentives and innovative technologies to support the link between Arctic states ports and domestic ports, as well as we are expanding the air route directly connected to the Arctic states. Prior to COVID-19, Korea has uh, operated visa-free program with all eight Arctic states. Human infrastructures must be established for long-term cooperation. Increasing mutual uh, human capacity building will not only broaden our understanding, but will also serve a basis for creating new and long-term cooperation. Korea has been promoting efforts for mutual understanding and communication with Arctic people through various programs for 10 years. By inviting scientists from Arctic states to promote joint research, Korea uses our expanding uh, personal exchanges in the Arctic by experiencing and working directly in the Arctic region. In addition, we are participating in the challenges facing the Arctic as observers of Arctic Council through the working group project. The Arctic Partnership Week, which is held every December in Korea, provides uh, opportunities for Korean government companies and researchers, researchers related to the Arctic uh, to interact directly with the leaders of the Arctic. In addition, more than 60 indigenous students participate in Korean Arctic Academy, which is a partnership program between university students in the Arctic states and Korea in cooperation with the University of Arctic. In addition, since 2011, uh, experts and leaders from three Asian states, such as Japan, China, and Korea, and three Arctic states such as US, Canada, and Russia in the Pacific region have jointly discussed the Arctic issues through the MPAC. MPAC provides intellectual exchange on the various point, viewpoints of the Arctic. Uh, as I explained, we have been promoting the establishment of infrastructures for connect with the Arctic through various programs, but challenges are still ahead of us. The sensitive Arctic needs more fair and balanced rules and standards. This found, foundation will further stimulate discussion on Arctic infrastructure and have predictable investment and cooperation. In addition, I think countries like Korea wants to be understood as a partner who respond uh, through cooperation to the issues and challenges of the Arctic rather than a divisional definition of non-Arctic countries classified by the geographical criteria. Considering various conditions, the Arctic infrastructure development is likely to uh, take place over a long-term 
um, period of time. In short term, it is highly likely to focus on infrastructure such as resources development, transportation, and human, human exchanges. Therefore, I think that efforts to minimize risk factors such as trust between stakeholders and transparency of the procedure are necessary. Last but not least, in order for such cooperation to continue, it is necessary to systematically discover and promote areas where mutual understanding can be lead to long term. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Justin. A great, uh, nice overview, and I would say an expansive definition of of infrastructure. Certainly, importantly, to include the uh, human dimension, education, uh, etc. So, uh, next, um, Natsu from uh, Japan. Yes, uh, good evening, good morning to all. Uh, firstly, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to giving me a chance to join this very, very important and very interesting uh, symposium. And uh, starting uh, my presentation, may I share uh, the slides here? Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so before talking about this slide, I'd like to talk about more practical examples about uh, regarding the uh, regarding the uh, infrastructure in the Arctic. So uh, my talk is somehow focusing on uh, sorry on about the utilization of the Arctic Ocean today. And the session theme of infrastructure in the broader sense, I'd like to start mentioning navigation rules and then transshipment hub in non-Arctic coast and then 3D fiber optic cable across the Arctic. And then I'd like to talk about this slide. So uh, the Pora code uh, gives an international standard for Arctic Ocean navigation and discussion of uh, heavy fuel oil HFO ban in the Arctic is also emerging in the IMO. On the other hand, uh, but regarding the Russian regulation of navigation, uh, this was is updated and becoming more useful manner for uh, these years. On the other hand, the sudden change so often uh, happens so often and those updates would not always fair for foreign users as well. On the other hand, uh, Transport Canada is implementing sophisticated, very sophisticated navigation rules for many years. And those knowledge is partly introduced into the PORA code as well. But unfortunately, commercial use of the Northwest Passage is not so active. So we had better accumulate practical experience for further achievement of the way of navigation through the Northwest Passage in terms of the commercial use. Uh, and, Professor uh, Oscar, I think yeah. you are sharing different slides. Oh, really? Yeah, we are just looking at science issues. Can you see these slides? Mm, uh, not... Sorry, sorry. I will share again. Thank you, Dr. Atsuka. And perhaps when you do share it, you can do it full screen. Can you see this slide? Is it? It's a science slide. Uh, science slide. To... Uh, yes, so I had prepared only this slide. Oh. So before oh, yeah. talking about this slide, I'd like to uh, introduce some ex uh, examples. Okay, if sorry for interruption. I'd like to talk okay. about Good. this slide. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, thank you. And uh, next, uh, talking about the shipment. Uh, through the Northern Sea Route. So uh, today, year-round shipment of LNG become reality in the currency area for uh, currency area from Yamaro Peninsula. And first expanding navigation period to cross the Northern Sea Route to the Pacific as well. 
and LNG transshipment hub is becoming a reality by Novatec and Mitsui OSK line and JBIC as well as uh, the, some information has already has already presented uh, before this session. And transshipment hub enables to puncture, puncture delivery of energy to Asian market. And transshipment base or transshipment port will be a very, very effective infrastructure for uh, shipment cargoes. But transshipment cost will be a large issue for economic feasibility. And in this regard, Russia is planning to develop trans Northern Syria container transport service together with uh, constructing transshipment hub in both Valency area, Valency coast and Pacific coast in around the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula. But it is uncertain whether it will, be, it will become reality. And finally, subsea cables. The project is making progress by Finland, Russia, Canada, and Japan. And in this project, uh, if this project become a reality, not only economic, but also social and other impact will appear for the relationship between regions or region, uh, regions overarching the Arctic. And this will be a new possibility for Arctic utilization by non-Arctic nations. And in relation to the developed achievement of the Northern Sea route shipping activities, integration of inland waterway and Northern Sea route has also discussed uh, today. And uh, talking about these uh, slides, so uh, the Arctic is facing many in difficult issues such as global warming, remoteness, sparse population, the unique condition of ecosystem and geographic condition as well. And uh, but, however, the, for example, large scale project or large scale development will be uh, the large impact for social uh, and economic conditions of Arctic and non-Arctic area. But uh, it is practical to start with small spec step to develop new economic activity and entrepreneurship. Of course, uh, those, uh, of course uh, those activities needs to consider sustainable approach in regional society or regional economy and uh, to uh, consider these uh, steps, the first step, the physical condition, uh, which uh, enables uh, by infrastructure, transport, data connection and business and so on, will be a uh, basement encouraged to share the data, uh, in data information and sharing problems sharing strengths and weakness and sharing possibility and risk and sharing visions. And also enables uh, the practical activity like such as cooperation, uh, developing inter interrelation and capacity building and so on. So the infrastructure in broad sense like uh, physical infrastructure and uh, other uh, regulations or other Non-physical infrastructure would be important issues to uh, develop the sustainable use of the Arctic. Thank you. Complexity of this subject, not only the infrastructure subject and how infrastructure interrelates with all these other components, but the complexity of everything that happens in the Arctic. Uh, undergoing great climate change, but globalization and linkage to natural resources, the human dimension, and of course, uh, what we're not really talking about in this session, the geopolitics, so huge complexity. On the next, a view from one of our national labs, uh, Laurie. Thank you, Lawson, and thank you, our organizers of this panel, as well as the two-day conference. I'm honored and pleased to be part of the conversation. My name is Lori Parrott. I manage research at one of the Department of Energy National Laboratories. Um, and since the late 1990s, my group has managed atmospheric research measurement user facilities or infrastructure on the North Slope of Alaska. Um, 
I think that because of that experience, there are three points I would like to make in my remarks. Number one, I think uh, looking at the scientific and technical resources across uh, these countries and these institutions, we have an opportunity to work together to develop innovative concepts for coordinating our networks of Arctic infrastructure, both mobile assets as well as permanent. And a particular focus of mine is thinking about the coming changes in the North American Arctic the opportunities for increasing our research and knowledge as Greenland, Canada, and the United States face changes in their sea ice and atmospheric conditions with the increase in shipping. Um, secondly, I have some lessons I think we've learned from operating permanent research stations that I think actually improve our science. Uh, number one, with our permanent research stations, we can provide the scientific community with longitudinal, decades-long, unique data sets that help inform climate measurements. These can complement the advanced um, advancements that are being made on maritime, remote sensing, and unmanned aerial measurements, but they are an important part of the equation that needs to be a part of our planning of a network. For example, the stations that my department operates uh, provide data to the Department of Energy's Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program. Uh, for over 20 years, we have provided uh, unique data sets that show long-term climate changes on the North Slope of Alaska. They show industrial or anthropogenic changes as industry has increased or decreased with uh, economics tides. And they've also provided important insights on seasonal variations, where, which are often an observational gap uh, for Earth system measurements, is understanding the shoulder seasons between summer and winter. Another interesting observation I have is that I think we do better science by operating infrastructure. We have built long-term relationships with indigenous communities on the North Slope of Alaska because they help us operate our infrastructure 365 days a year. So we understand the challenges they are facing in their subsistence hunting, in raising their families, in encouraging their children not to become a part of the brain drain. Um, and we are also very cognizant that we provide valuable long-term employment in these small communities. Um, so it is a good win-win partnership. I think that that helps our scientists be more sensitive to the importance of the research that they're undertaking and also think about how to do it in a sustainable and culturally appropriate way. For instance, in the village of Utkjervik or Barrow, we have worked with one company for over 20, 24 years. Um, these are good, stable jobs. We have gotten to know these people for a long, long periods of time and help engage in partnerships with their schools and their businesses. In addition, they help us navigate the complicated politics um, in a small village in Alaska. Uh, where there are many stakeholders, many different people who, who uh, handle the environmental pit, um, permitting, the logistics, and the finance. They are key advisors to us on structuring our science projects in ways that they can be successful. Our facility at Aliktok Point in the Prudhoe Bay area gives us different, you, different insights into working with the petroleum industry, and the national security institutions that are present in place. So we have a better understanding of how our science can contribute to decisions they have to make where their coastal erosion is going to force them to move assets or facilities, how our science could lead not to just admiring the problem, but helping somebody make a decision um, of where to invest or how. And finally, by operating long-term infrastructure, we've been able to build very robust academic partnerships. We have worked with the uh, International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks for many years. And because of that, we have built new partnerships and our scientists um, have the relationships, the trust and the confidence to work on new proposals. So it's actually infrastructure has not only enabled science 
um, but has driven it forward because of these operational relationships. For example, we are working now with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, with the University of Alabama and Merrick Corporation on new concepts for a high Arctic research center um, in Eastern Alaska to complement what is in the Western Alaska region and hopefully connect to a larger network of Canada, Greenland, and other international research stations. We would welcome further cooperation and conversation with you about how this concept could complement your country's efforts and needs. My final comment is that I think we also have an opportunity um, as this collective to think about um, beyond sustainable development of, of infrastructure to think about adding um, rigorous climate-based predictions to help our corporations or our national security institutions or our communities plan for developing infrastructure that will be resilient decades into the future. We know how long it takes to plan and get approval for and finance infrastructure. We don't want them to be built on engineering standards from 15 years ago or 20 years ago that don't include the best of climate predictions and understanding how infrastructure can be built in a resilient fashion. Thank you. Emphasizing long-term measurements and in infrastructure and also the uh, prediction capabilities. Uh, the one sector you didn't mention would be the insurance companies. And surely uh, not only all the industries you spoke about, but the insurance companies need all of this prediction capability so that we, we can reduce the high risk in, in the Arctic. One thing I should mention, I learned last week at meetings with Laurie, one of the experiments that uh, the laboratory is uh, having off the north, north Slope, last week they stretched out a 30 kilometer fiber optic cable for acoustic monitoring, monitoring the sounds of, from whales to ships to the ice. So it's a new tool, an advanced uh, fiber optic cable. And, and, and the operation is a public-private partnership because industry uh, and, and leading tech company has provided the cable. So thanks, thanks, Laurie, for your views. And you. next, next from China, uh, Yang, um, Yang Zhen, please. Uh, thank you, Lawson. Uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited to participate in this very important uh, event. Uh, uh, Arctic is very important to the whole world in terms of the global uh, the Earth system and the uh, climate change. The panelists uh, yesterday and the previous speaker have made a very good presentation. Uh, the change in the Arctic is rapid. Uh, and the, the, uh, the need for knowledge for Arctic governance is huge. And at the same time, uh, the, the technology uh, of modern technology development is in a, a transformative phase. So I believe that in near future, we'll witness the new change and new phases of the uh, uh, infrastructure in the Arctic. Uh, the, our uh, topic of uh, our symposium is a focus on Asia's interests. Uh, Japan, Korea, and China, uh, the Asia country had advantage in the uh, new technology and uh, in Arctic uh, infrastructure. In last decades, as you know, that uh, Chinese enterprises and the Chinese government uh, have participated in many uh, Arctic uh, infrastructure. Uh, here, I, could, I don't want to list uh, all of them, but I just want to share uh, my uh, observation with you from what happened or what planned infrastructure project. Uh, I, my personal view is there are several kinds of the way of cooperation for China's the, uh, infrastructure building capability to involve in Arctic cooperation as follows. The first kind uh, as a construction builder, 
Chinese uh, enterprises bid for some of the Arctic projects uh, of Arctic countries and participate with some of part of it. For example, uh, some deep water port uh, near our coast of Russia and the railway project connecting uh, Arctic port to other uh, Russian city. And also the bridge project in Norway, uh, Mr. Gao Feng, yeah, yesterday he mentioned about the connectivity. The second kind is uh, the China as an invest, investor. Uh, for example, the Yamar LNG project uh, to support the infrastructure of LNG project. Uh, to my memory, in uh, a, a Yamar LNG project, some Chinese company used the module construction to join the Yamar project. That's the components produced in China factory and transport components from China to the field of Yamar and the Finnish field installation there. I think that's the way they try their best to reduce the local environment uh, impact. A uh, third kind that uh, Chinese company, Chinese factory uh, built some large equipment for uh, Arctic uh, uh, countries, Arctic uh, uh, company. For example, the offshore oil drilling platform, China built it for Norway. That's designed by Norway, but it's built it in, in, in China. And a deep water cage for our, 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 our aquaculture of salmon uh, near the uh, Trumso. Uh, the uh, fourth kind that's the uh, some large equipment or vessel or uh, infrastructure they build is uh, uh, made in China, is owned by China, uh, but it, uh, it's uh, also a service to uh, some mission to Arctic, like uh, Arctic uh, uh, science uh, research and expedition, and also for the other for the uh, commercial use, for example, the LNG tank. And also for science expedition, that's the, like a Xuelong tool, the vessel, research vessel, and other uh, scientific uh, monetary equipment. Uh, from the, uh, the uh, Mozak science monetary program, uh, the, the, it showed us that the need for monitoring uh, floating, automatic and floating monitoring system in future. So I think uh, that uh, uh, to monitor the the to change and uh, how to get the, the uh, get collected new data about the change, and uh, I believe that the Arctic uh, Science Ministry uh, conference is a very uh, good start. So China have the uh, capability to provide such kind of the uh, infrastructure. Uh, fifth is kind. Um, uh, I think that should be. The global information infrastructure as kind of the public good provide. provide. Uh, for example, the Trans Arctic Submarine Optical Cable Project. For example, the uh, Global Navigation Satellite System, uh, GNSS. Uh, you know that uh, the, the U US had the GPS, uh, European have a Galileo, and China have a Beidou system, and in Russia, have the economies, you know, to my memory, in 2015, uh, China and Russia, uh, the, the two sides make a, a agreement, a communique, that they, they want to uh, strengthen the practical cooperation in satellite navigation between Russia's economies system and in China's Beidou system to improve the capability and interoperation. I think that uh, this uh, part of the uh, importance uh, infrastructure for, for we can get uh, some the help us uh, capability to uh, search and rescue and also uh, tell us about the climate change and the change of ice and even the drift of the iceberg. And uh, the fifth, uh, the sixth, I think, uh, uh, it, it, just as uh, Justin mentioned, that's uh, in future, there's a, a need for smart porch. Uh, in in in, uh, in Arctic, China, Japan, Korea have such a cap uh, capability, and especially when this uh, Internet of Thing 
will be uh, uh, applied in the Arctic. That be a uh, new uh, way of the for the northeast passage uh, the usage. Uh, I, I just want to share with you about the uh, my observation the six kind of the uh, way of the cooperation of China's uh, capability in infrastructure to involve in the uh, in Arctic the, the infrastructures building. Uh, I, I should say here that's because the uh, Arctic, the, the biosystem or environment is fragile. So the any, no matter is in the search, in the science uh, of purpose uh, and, and the human purpose or even the economic purpose. I think all this infrastructure should have a high, uh, more uh, strict uh, environment protection. Uh, to ending my uh, my my remark, I want to, as a Chinese scholar, I want to uh, uh, share with you my expectation on the uh, U.S. the uh, Arctic policy of when after uh, Biden uh, Biden uh, took into the uh, White House, because the the, the uh, Mr. Pompeo's the remarks in May of uh, two thousand nineteen. I think that's of course a worry. Uh, we worry about the uh, Arctic issue will change from the uh, climate change track to our new uh, Cold War in Arctic. Uh, the last session, Michael Perkinson also mentioned about worry about the intrude of geopolitics or competition in Arctic uh, impact on our the uh, science cooperation and the commercial cooperation in a sustainable way. Thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, emphasizing scale of some of this infrastructure. I tend to think a little bit smaller, but you were thinking global and, and large, uh, particularly systems like satellites and engineering ports and uh, those kind of structures. I, I, I do think in, in commenting about the policy of the future, I, I think our policy in the United States will be certainly more expansive uh, the Arctic is about people, environment, uh, natural resource development, economics, and geopolitics, of course, but not solely focused on uh, China and Russia in, in a geopolitical sense, maybe for the globe, but not, not for the Arctic. So thank you very much for your comments. And, and, and finally, uh, Sherry, my colleague at the Wilson Center, uh, you get to hear everybody before you, and what are your thoughts here? <laughs> in this complex subject of infrastructure. Well, thank, thank you very much, Lawson. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and all my fellow panelists. Uh, first, let me thank the terrific Wilson Center team. Uh, Mike Zafrega does a fabulous job assisted by uh, Michaela uh, Stith and Jack Durkee and many others behind the scenes who uh, put a lot of effort into putting these programs together. Uh, and many people over the last two days. And also, so let me thank also all of our partners here in Japan, uh, South Korea and China for your participation. Um, it's very important. Uh, I've had the opportunity to serve, um, you know, in, in, in government and serve and work and been in all of your countries and work with you on science and technology cooperation and security cooperation. Uh, when times were right, and there's much that we can do. Uh, and I think that when we think about the infrastructure in the Arctic, and, and all of you have mentioned this in, in, so, many, in so many ways, um, it's not just a technical discussion because the human element is of course indeed important. And the concepts of sustainability of infrastructure in the Arctic are important, but really what we need to move from is from sustainability uh, to resilience. So what, what does that mean? I mean, the, arc, the reason we're having this long discussion on infrastructure in the Arctic is because the climate is changing and it now permits, in some ways, demands uh, greater infrastructure to connect us across various domains uh, because of both the challenges, the retreating sea ice, the warming temperatures, the thawing permafrost, and the opportunities for navigation um, economic resources, uh, transportation, um, 
and other and other up and other knowledge and development opportunities. So the infrastructure needs not only to be sustainable in conditions as we've understood it for half for a quarter century now, but resilient to those changing climate conditions. So I would hark back to the comments each of you made and particularly Lori made about the climate downscaling and the mod being able to use uh, the advances we now have um, in climate models better to understand how our infrastructure across all the categories that we have discussed today, whether it's the research infrastructure being rapidly developed uh, across the high Arctic, uh, which I think is gonna be so important for us to better understand those environmental changes, whether it's the shipboard infrastructure or high Arctic research stations or the work at Svalbard or elsewhere. Um, the, the transportation and communications infrastructure that uh, each of you talked about, uh, particularly now connecting China across and Asian markets across to Europe, um, that is um, coming with great opportunity, but with also some price and certainly some risk, uh, considerable risk, not only economic risk, um, but risks, uh, other, other risks to life and limb uh, potentially and to ecological damage that could occur should there be you know, oil spills. Um, and that's why we have these robust and increasingly need to be more robust agreements within the Arctic Council on search and rescue and oil spill prevention. And thirdly on science and technology where I think there's a lot more that can be done with that. And many of you are working in those research institutions that will enable that uh, really to happen. Um, and the emergency response and security infrastructure, I think, will also need to become uh, more robust in future years. Uh, each nation, of course, has its own emergency response and security infrastructure, but increasingly when we look to the future and what the future may hold, um, it will require coordinated responses across nations. Uh, and so I think that is going to be, that's a, a coming challenge to connect appropriately our, both our transportation, search and rescue, communication, satellite infrastructure for peaceful opportunities, uh, recognizing the other challenges uh, that lie therein. And then, you know, finally, of course, the energy infrastructure, both the opportunities with the shorter shipping times, uh, but the continuing opportunities for uh, fossil fuel extraction in a climate in a, in a warming world uh, present a number a, a number of challenges um, that we all are quite familiar with. So I I um, I hope very much that this collaboration um, will take advantage of the opportunities for greater investment, uh, both government investment and private investment, to help us build out that climate modeling downscaling. Um, that we need better to convert sustainable infrastructure really into resilient uh, infrastructure for the future. And um, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Lawson uh, and why don't we go into some Q and A. Yeah, thank you, Sherry, great. Thanks for uh, focusing in on uh, cooperation. I mean, in my mind, we have many of the political arrangements now on some of these practical issues of SAR, oil spill preparedness and, and uh, response, et cetera. But, but we really do lack the infrastructure to uh, orchestrate them cooperatively uh, just because of the huge gap in the, at the top of the world, at least in marine infrastructure. Uh, I, I don't see any questions from the audience yet. We've got about 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to start with a question of my own uh, which deals with uh, the role of public-private partnerships in this business of bringing about infrastructure in the Arctic. Anyone, uh, anyone care to comment about how you see public-private partnerships cooperating uh, and investing? Anyone have a thought? Yeah, Justin, please. Thank you very much. 
Uh, actually, I have a question to Lori. Uh, I think you have very, very unique experiences of the partnership between public and the private companies in in, in battle with Kiabek, uh, monitoring for long years. Uh, so I think the uh, I want to hear about the what what contributions uh, to your uh, research and the monitoring system from private company and also what is the benefit to the uh, your activities uh, to the, the private companies I, I hope to hear that thank you unmute thank you um, for the question because our research is usually funded by the federal government we have to work in a pre-competitive arrangement um, we can't do something that provides a competitive advantage for one company over another. But when there, we can make the case, for instance, on this um, uh, digital acoustic signal um, fiber optic cable that's going along the Arctic seafloor, uh, Quintilian had some unused fiber that they aren't using. Uh, we were able to make the case that the scientific value of getting to uh, test that cable under um, the Arctic Ocean, uh, determine how we're going to handle the boatloads of data, it's petabytes, petabytes, petabytes of data, and determine can we glean some environmental intelligence from that that we can then publish to the entire community. Um, you know, that was a valid use of a public-private partnership. In Barrow, where we work with these um, small companies to help provide maintenance. That is more of a clear subcontracting um, arrangement, but the long-term friendships we build with these families who work for us, uh, we, we think encourage additional scientific research and opportunity. They give us an opportunity to engage in the community and um, better sharpen our scientific questions um, as well as our science plans to not interfere with whaling or fishing or to understand what it is about the sea ice movement that um, disrupts village activities. And so it's those sorts of partnerships that I find yield um, a lot of value to our scientific work. Th thank you, Laurie and, and Justin for that question, good. Uh, let me give you an example from my experience of a public-private partnership in the United States. It's here in Alaska. It's called the Marine Exchange of Alaska. And essentially, it's a monitoring and a surveillance of ships' systems using AIS and land-based AIS uh, and, and, and having coverage across the whole, all of Alaska. Th this this uh, nonprofit organization is funded by half of it, funded by industry, all the shipping companies who buy into this and pay a fee. It's funded partially by the state of Alaska and partially by the United States Coast Guard. So we have federal government, state government, and industry in, in what I think is a true public-private partnership devoted to directly to what we're talking about, at least in part, marine safety, environmental protection, protecting the coasts, monitoring shipping, providing guidance to shipping, even the marine exchange provides weather information, environmental information. Uh, the sec second question I have uh, deals with uh, very specifically to ports. I mean, if we're going to use the Arctic Ocean uh, in, in many different ways, there aren't many ports in the Arctic Ocean. There are a few along the Russian Arctic, but very few around the rest of the periphery of the basin. A a any thoughts? Maybe, maybe uh, uh, Natsu, do you have any thoughts on ports and their distribution, their required uh, investment? Okay, thank you, Rosan. Yes, ports are the very, very basic uh, infrastructure and background for uh, the commercial shipping, not only commercial shipping, but also the uh, safety navigation. And as you mentioned, that there's a very little uh, port 
uh, along the Northern Siberia the Russian coastal area, and those ports are very small, and uh, and the, the structure is very old. So, but the shipping company uh, tends to uh, use larger ship for uh, the uh, shipping cost. So mostly the those international uh, uh, vessels that are uh, used for international shipping activities, uh, the coast around the Russian coast, Arctic coast is not capable for those larger ships. And uh, it is, it costs very high, it requires very high cost to uh, renovate uh, those infrastructure. So the private company could not do that. And there's very little uh, cargo demand around the Russian coastal area. So it is not uh, commercially, it is not feasible to uh, invest uh, those ports for uh, to be capable for the larger ships that cross the uh, Arctic Ocean between the Pacific and Atlantic. But uh, so the starting uh, with small steps to connect the more small scale shipping activities around the Russian coast to prepare for a little more larger uh, cargo ships to inter integrate inland sea waterway and uh, the uh, uh, northern sea. Route. This could be the first step, and then uh, following the achievement of the shipping activity, port infrastructure should be renovated by maybe public par uh, private partnership in the Russian uh, society. Thank you. Yes, uh, th thank you, Natsu. We, we do have some questions uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, how might the rapidly growing cruise ship industry in the Arctic be expected to invest in safety and environmental protection infrastructure? What's the role of of the uh, tourist industry, marine tourist industry in in, in infrastructure. Of course, there's not gonna be much tourist industry this summer in the Canadian Arctic or likely in and around Alaska or anywhere in the Arctic because of COVID last year and this year. But but there's some sense that, that the cruise ship industry is uh, evolving and increasing. So what's the cruise ship industry's role in this? A any Any thoughts? Anyone? Lawson, this is Lori. It seems like I want to pick up on Justin's theme that this is a, a great uh, potential opportunity for public and private partnerships. That um, uh, there's, a, there's an economic incentive for these tourist-based industries to ensure that they can safely protect their customers and the um, public institutions could help ensure that they have search and rescue plans that are robust, that are sustainable um, and that support other public needs um, such as protecting the fishing industry, protecting science researchers or protecting national security installations. The, the, thank you, Laurie. I mean, there are, to, to add to this uh, discussion, there are ideas about using a fee system for cruise ships. We, we have a fee for the cruise ships in Alaska. And those fees could be used for, uh, let's say, uh, oil spill response and caches of equipment, or um, probably not for charting and hydrography, but maybe for other systems that relate to marine safety and environmental protection. So it's not out of the question to have a fee system, but those fees would be for um, infrastructure related to safety and environmental protection. Any, any other thoughts? Yeah, pl please, uh, Natsu. Uh, thank you, Rosan. As you mentioned, the infrastructure in regarding the, uh, the basimetry, so the most of the cargo ships are navigating in the certain very limited area, which are provided by uh, the information of the uh, basimetry. On the other hand, the cruise ship 
uh, might go anywhere. And the Arctic Ocean is not, uh, the vast majority of Arctic Ocean is somehow still uncertain in many places. So uh, the information of the vast majority is very important for cruise industry. And the Arctic Council Pain Working Group are uh, acting, uh, the, uh, the Arctic Marine Tourism Project uh, regarding the, to provide best practical uh, best practice guidelines and also the IECO is also uh, implementing the guidelines for cruising, but the uh, but the information is still lacking, I suppose. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think uh, the coastal Arctic states, of course, have the responsibility to to, to uh, conduct a hydrography and chart their own waters. The question is how you do it cooperatively and can you use commercial ships to actually gather data if they have the right equipment? So it's a good question. The, the cruise ship industry could contribute to that. Uh, the, the next question is a seminal one and I was gonna bring it up, but thankfully- also, somebody I, I, think you, uh, I, think, I think Yang wanted to comment. Oh yes, please. I didn't catch that. Sure, go ahead. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Yang. Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, I have a uh, I have a question for Lawson. <laughs> If, if I could, that uh, uh, in last uh, several years, that uh, compared to the new, many news about infrastructure from the Nordic part and the Russian part, uh, the uh, North America uh, compared the, the comparatively quiet. <laughs> I just uh, my question for you: uh, in, you are in Alaska uh, in near future. Uh, could you share uh, with us about uh, some of the new infrastructure we will take, uh, uh, we'll build, or uh, we'll take shape in uh, uh, in North America, and uh, what uh, kind of opportunity that uh, East Asia country can join in there? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, it, one of the uh, pieces of infrastructure that was mentioned today is this port in Nome. Um, my sense of this is, is a bit uh, maybe different. I think the port of Nome will be at first funded by the government for security reasons, to have a place to park icebreaker, maybe a combatant, but also a commercial ship, survey ship, et cetera. So that piece of infrastructure probably will be built by government. and. You, you know, we, we really don't have any marine infrastructure in the whole coast of Alaska from Dutch Harbor to the Canada United States border. So in some sense, it's open for investment and me Treadwell has worked on this question, of course, and others. And uh, not only domestic investment, but foreign investment because of the nearly complete lack of an infrastructure but some of the infrastructure is responsibility of government, hydrography and charting. Only, only about 6% of this large place is charted to modern and international standards. So we, we have a lot to go, but, but infrastructure like communication systems, fiber optic cables, of course, are all potentially available, maybe port infrastructure and other smaller places to um, foreign investment. Let, let me uh, turn to the important question of the role of uh, that's being asked here, the role of um, the Arctic indigenous people in, in infrastructure development. The Arctic indigenous people are owners. They're also stakeholders and actors, but they're owners of the place. So what's there? I think the question is a good one. It's being asked by uh, Nicholas Parleto, I think is the name. And it's a, it's a central question. 
how local communities can be better engaged in benefit sharing and coastal government governance through infrastructure development. I, uh, Justin mentioned some of this, but uh, any thoughts by any of the panelists? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. I think they are just uh, lost mention that the indigenous people, that's the, uh, they are the local people and also they are the owner of the, of the, of that top part of the, the land and also have a long history, traditional culture there. So when we mention about the, uh, the infrastructure, that the one of infrastructure is that uh, we should, I, I believe that there's a digital gap between the, the pe people in the Arctic other part of uh, the, the Arctic country and the northern part of the, uh, the, uh, the country. So it, uh, the, the, the digital uh, ga uh, ga gap can be narrowed. I think it's not a very, uh, uh, very big uh, technical uh, difficulties of optical. But uh, I, I think at, at the same time, how can we help the indigenous people to have some of their traditional content to, to, to put in the internet, to let them the traditional, if when, once they got uh, connected with mm -hmm. internet, the digital, the 5Gs, uh, that they, they, are, they are very easy to be, be, be drawn to a current of the new technology, change their, 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 their traditional bloodline of culture very easily. So how can we help them with the, uh, the help of the technology, the accessibility to the new technology, but I'd say they are very easy to maintain in their local land, not the move, the move, but they find a job there. And also they could maintain, they have their traditional cultures content to let them to introduce themselves, let them uh, identify themselves. I think and that's a, important for the near future. I believe that for the health, for their living standard, I, I believe this infrastructure can help it. I, I think that's easy to do, but how to maintain their traditional culture, uh, help them to build some of the content of the, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, great. A any other thoughts about how to, how indigenous people can be integrated with uh, decision making on infrastructure and be part of the planning for all of this. Any any thoughts, anyone? Well, Lawson, yeah. you know, look, they're really on, um, you know, the indigenous communities are on the front lines. So they, you know, and, and so they need, they're part of, they're the front line domain awareness. Uh, their front line in sort of knowing how the environment is changing, uh, understanding the ecology um, much better. So they need to be part and parcel of the planning and design of infrastructure. And they also need to benefit from the economic opportunities. Uh, certainly in Alaska, where the economy needs to diversify away from fossil fuels, if we can build more sustainable and resilient infrastructure, those economic opportunities should be available to those transitioning out of fossil fuels development. Um, and so that's, um, you know, that, that's gonna be a key, a key part of the economic opportunity for the citizens of the region. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's great, great point. Uh, Justin, I think you, you had a point, good. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree with Shari's comments. Uh, indigenous group, indigenous communities, uh, they live there for a long time and they have their own knowledges uh, for traditional knowledges. Uh, this knowledge is intangible, but this is very important factors, how to design, how to proceed and decide the speed of the development should be uh, consider uh, their knowledges and traditional knowledges. So this can be a more sustainable and the resilient approaches for the development of infrastructures. So uh, this is very basic, but very important point. Uh, how can we uh, introduce or respect their traditional knowledges in the development of the RT infrastructures? Thank you. Yeah, good, good point. W one of the challenges 
in the Arctic Council, of course, we have the permanent participants, the Arctic indigenous peoples groups that, that are with the Arctic state representatives. And all these study groups and uh, all these working groups of the Arctic Council, like, like the uh, PAME, Protection of the Arctic Marine Environment, all of the measures and systems we're trying to design bring in indigenous knowledge and indigenous experts right at the working group level so, so that they can help shape some of the measures and some of the and, and determine what some of the infrastructure might be. And this is all really related to um, environmental protection and marine safety measures. So good question. We could spend uh, days and have a conference, but we would need to have uh, some indigenous representatives to get a good feel for the frontline uh, picture and uh, impacts. So thank, thanks for the great question from the audience. Uh, the, the next question we have, I guess we have about five minutes left. Is that Mike? Mike, is that what we have? Actually, actually Lawson, we're getting close. Maybe about uh, just, I'm sorry, but maybe just a minute or two left. Just a minute or two left. Yeah. Uh, anyone, uh, let me turn to the panelists. If you have any final thoughts on, on this, uh, I won't take a question from the audience now. Any final thoughts, quick one, about this topic? Hugely complex for sure. Uh, I thought the issues that we talked about scale, local to global, on this issue, investment challenges, need for public-private partnerships, um, role of the Arctic Council in this, but the role of industry is is huge here, both on the research front, but but of course on the civil um, development front as as well. So huge complexity. Thank thank you all uh, for a good discussion and your presentations. I think we got some good thoughts about this, some very broad and narrow thoughts, both uh, covered. So thank you very much for your participation. And over, over to you, Mike, for your thoughts. Let, let me just turn it right back to Shihoko. Shihoko, let me, let me ask you for your, for your thoughts first. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no, well, well, thank you, um, Lawson, for steering this final discussion that has really expanded the definition and our understanding of infrastructure inclusiveness and sustainability. And we're now at the end of our two day forum. We've covered a lot of ground to define and determine Asian interests in the new Arctic from geopolitics to economic interests to environmental security and beyond. And of course, um, as Lawson said, our conversations have only touched the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, about the way forward. And I hope we can continue to host similarly thought-provoking events in the future. Uh, but before I hand it over to Mike Sprague to officially conclude our proceedings, I wanted to remind you that uh, both days have been recorded online and will be available on the Wilson Center's website. In addition, a publication summarizing our discussions over the past two days will be produced and will be available online soon as well. And now over to you, Mike, for the final word. Uh, Mike, it's, oh, uh, thank you. Mike, Mike yes. it's lost. Could I just ask if uh, the panelists took any notes or you're able to take some notes that, that you maybe uh, pass them to me when you get a chance, because I'll probably have to write this summary. So I, uh, I took some of my own, but if you had some notes, I'd be happy to have them. Thank you. Thank you, Lawson. And, and I can say that uh, we have a number of our Wilson Center uh, interns and team taking notes these last two days uh, for each of the panels. And as Shihoko noted, it is fully recorded. So we will have uh, assistance for the crafting of the, of the proceedings out of this as well. Uh, with one minute left, let me just thank all of the two dozen experts who shared their perspectives over the last two days. And Shihoko, uh, I, I think we have some work cut out for us to continue this discussion uh, in the way that we have done here today, which is expanding, opening the aperture here on 
uh, what is happening in the Arctic and, and which other countries have interests and equities in the Arctic and to listen to, listen to their insights and their perspectives uh, going forward. So I wanna thank you for your support. Of course, our friends at the Embassy of Japan in the U United States, all of the moderators that have spent time crafting this two-day event and particularly, uh, we, we thanked uh, our own Wilson staff and that, that goes without saying, but I'm, I'm glad it's been highlighted for two days. But let me thank our broadcast leadership back at the Wilson Center. Uh, without their expertise, we can't run these programs. So I wanna thank John Tyler and his team. Today, we had Jared Thompson and Trion Burgess with us. Uh, we simply can't do these programs without having a robust broadcast leadership team back at the Woodrow Wilson Center at 1300 Pennsylvania Avenue helping us do this uh, and also from their homes. So to all of my colleagues and friends, uh, to the team Wilson, thank you so very much and look forward to providing for you the proceedings and the recordings uh, that, were, that are coming up the next few weeks. And I am sure we will be convening once again on this and related topics. So on behalf of the Wilson Center, the Asia Program and all my colleagues at the Polar Institute, thank you for joining us for the last two days and thank you for sharing your expertise and we'll talk to you very soon. Have a good morning, good afternoon, and a good evening.